Salwete, and welcome back to Weekly Roman History. This is part 14 on Caesar's dictatorship and the rise of Augustus in the aftermath of Caesar's assassination. The content warning for this video is suicide. To review, a generation prior, Sulla marched his personal army on Rome, showing that a warlord can gain permanent dictatorial power. Caesar, an enterprising young warlord in the making, forges an alliance with two older, more powerful warlords, Pompey and Crassus, which is called the Triumvirate. These three rule Rome together for a few harmonious years, but a partnership based on power is doomed to fall to ambition. Crassus dies in a military defeat in the Middle East, then Pompey turns on Caesar. Caesar marches his legions on Rome and defeats Pompey in battle in Greece. Pompey is then murdered in Egypt. Now Caesar is the undisputed sole ruler of Rome. What next? Here's our roadmap. Caesar sticks around in Egypt for a while, consolidating Roman power in the east, before coming back to Rome and ruling as its perpetual dictator. But the senators he has displaced aren't content to sit on the sidelines, and they create a conspiracy to murder him. After Caesar's death, a second triumvirate emerges to avenge him and take power for themselves. They kill the conspirators and then turn on each other. The two most powerful players, Octavian and Mark Anthony, coexist uneasily for a few years. Then, in a final civil war, Octavian defeats Antony. Octavian takes the name Augustus and takes sole power as Rome's first emperor, ending the Republic period in 27 BCE. So, we open in Egypt. A struggle has been going on. The child king Ptolemy XIII and his adult sister Cleopatra VII Philopater are fighting over the throne. When Pompey lands in Egypt, it's advisors of Ptolemy who have him beheaded, hoping to win favor with Caesar. It has the opposite effect. Caesar is angered by their betrayal and winds up siding with Cleopatra. His troops help Cleopatra's army defeat Ptolemy's, and Cleopatra takes the throne. Famously, she and Caesar then become lovers. Cleopatra later gives birth to Caesar's only known son, Caesarion. Caesar fights some more in the east, including a famous victory against Pharnaces at Zella, about which he writes, Waini Weedy Weeki, I came, I saw, I conquered. Finally, he faces off against the last of the Optimates in Africa. When Caesar wins, many of the Optimates commit suicide. Even though Caesar is known to spare his Roman enemies, they would rather die than live in Caesar's Rome. The famous story is that Cato the Younger runs himself through with a sword, which is actually a very slow way to die. Caesar is coming to see Cato to extend his mercy, and some doctors start to stitch him up. But Cato rips out his intestines with his own hands to undo their work. While he's away fighting, Caesar is named dictator a number of times. Dictator for 10 years in 46, then extended to perpetual dictator in 44. Caesar finally returns to Rome in late 45, and does a lot of needed reform there. He fixes the calendar, which has been a mess for centuries. We can thank Caesar for our year of 365 and one quarter days. He also starts building new forums and a new senate house to replace the Curia Hostilia that burned as Clodius's funeral pyre a decade earlier. It will become the Curia Iulia. None of it will be finished in Caesar's lifetime. Most significantly, Caesar starts to name people to offices like quaestor, praetor, and consul on his own. His position as dictator allows him to control the political process unilaterally, rather than worrying about elections or the Senate. He puts his own face on coins, which has never been done before in Rome. The coin I'm showing you right now is the first time a living mortal was ever put on a Roman coin. This is the norm in the East, which is where Caesar is getting a lot of his ideas about how to rule. In another Eastern practice, Caesar sets up a college of priests to worship him as a god. His right-hand man, Marcus Antonius, or Mark Anthony, is in charge of the new priesthood of Caesar. By the way, you can always recognize Mark Anthony's statue because he has that ramen noodle hair. The one honor Caesar does not accept is the name of Rex, king. Remember that after the expulsion of the last king, the Romans swore they'd never have a king again. The culture of the Republic is such that Caesar can get away with calling himself a god, but not a king. Not that it doesn't come up. A crowd of adoring supporters call him king, to which he responds, I'm not Rex, I'm Caesar. Anthony tries to give him a golden laurel crown, and Caesar refuses it. We'll never know how sincere all this was. Maybe he was purposefully testing the waters, or working up to eventually accepting the title of king after he'd refused enough times. By early 44 BCE, Caesar's power is absolute. There's just one thing. 
Caesar famously showed clementia, mercy, to his Roman opponents, which no warlord before him had. This means that a lot of his old adversaries are still alive in Rome, plotting how best to challenge him. Caesar's obvious disregard for the norms and processes of the Republic leads a lot of his former supporters, especially the aristocrats, to ally with those who oppose him. They believe that the Senate must kill Caesar, just as the Senate killed Romulus, Rome's first tyrant. The leaders of the conspiracy are Gaius Cassius Longinus and Marcus Unius Brutus, a descendant of Lucius Unius Brutus, the first consul who expelled Rome's tyrannical last king, Tarquinius Superbus. See, even when we get into the factual eras, Rome's history is just so literary. Both Cassius and Brutus come from illustrious families. Both had supported Pompey and been pardoned by Caesar. A lot of senators join the conspiracy. Famously, Cicero does not, though he supports the spirit of it. Caesar is planning on leaving Rome to fight the Parthians on March 18th, so the conspiracy knows they have to make their move before then. They decide on the Senate meeting that will happen on March 15th, known in the Roman calendar as the Ides of March. So on the Ides of March 44 BCE, Caesar enters the theater of Pompey, which is the Senate's temporary meeting place while the new Senate house is being constructed. There are tales of bad omens, bad dreams sent to both Caesar and his wife Calpurnia, though I'm sure no matter what day the assassination had happened, we could have found some bad omens to point to. There, Caesar is stabbed 23 times at the foot of the giant statue of Pompey, his former ally and adversary. See? Literary. His famous last words, et tu brute, or you too, Brutus, were totally made up by Shakespeare. They are not historical. There were a lot of rumors about his last words at the time. You too, my son, in Greek, also directed at Brutus, or, but this is violence. It must have been a chaotic scene, with dozens of knife-wielding senators crowding around one guy. A lot of the senators accidentally stabbed each other's arms instead of Caesar. So the most likely scenario is that no one heard Caesar's last words, or that he didn't really have any besides... <laughs> Real life isn't a play, and everyone doesn't fall silent to give the dictator a moment to say something historically important. Caesar is slaughtered like an animal. As chaotic and difficult as it surely was, the conspirators are sending a definite message with this death. It would have been simpler and safer to choose one or two people to kill Caesar. By doing it together, they tell Rome that this is a collective action done for the common good. It is no one's petty revenge, not a murder to be prosecuted, but a political act undertaken by a harmonious agreement of senators. It is the restoration of the Republic. But it isn't, of course. It looks good temporarily. The conspirators explain themselves to the people, who agree that it is a good thing to bring back the Republic, even though they loved Caesar. But Caesar's former right-hand man, Mark Antony, is working with another general named Marcus Aemilius Lepidus on their next moves. The conspirators may have killed the most powerful of the warlords, but warlords aren't going anywhere. Caesar's will is read publicly. In it, Caesar donates much of his land to the public and gives 300 sesterces cash to every citizen. The people are moved by Caesar's generosity and riot against the Senate, encouraged by Antony and Lepidus. Brutus and Cassius flee Rome. Lepidus makes himself Pontifex Maximus to replace Caesar and leaves to fight a war in Spain against Pompey's son, Sextus Pompey. War is spreading against the younger Pompey and against the conspirators, which suits the warlords Antony and Lepidus just fine. There's just one aspect of Caesar's will that rubs them the wrong way. Gaius Octavius is 18 years old and Caesar's great nephew. His grandmother was Caesar's sister. His father was a Noah's homo who reached the praetorship but died young. Not a particularly distinguished young man, but he had accompanied Caesar on his Spanish campaign in 45 and impressed him. So Caesar had made Octavius his official heir in his will, posthumously adopting him. Gaius Octavius becomes Gaius Julius Caesar Octavianus. Most historians call him Octavian, so I will too, though he would have objected. He referred to himself as Caesar. Octavian interprets his adoption as an inheritance of Caesar's position, as warlord and as dictator. He comes to Rome with every intention of taking control of Caesar's legions. Antony and Lepidus certainly disagree, because they have earned the loyalty of these troops, which matters more than any will. At first, they don't consider this teenager a threat, but then Octavian begins to pull supporters to him among the soldiers and the people. 
He has a lot of the same charisma as Caesar, and he uses it the same way, to gain loyalty as a step toward power. His closest advisor is a school friend named Marcus Whipsanius Agrippa, who comes from an undistinguished family but will be catapulted into the center of Roman politics through his association with Octavian. Octavian proves himself a force to be reckoned with by marching on Rome with eight legions to demand the consulship. Lepidus reaches out to him to form an alliance with him and Antony against their common enemy, the conspirators. The second triumvirate is born, Antony, Lepidus, and Octavian. Rome has seen an explosion of military might. At the time of the first triumvirate, there were 15 total Roman legions of about 5,000 soldiers each. Now, there are 60. Antony and Octavian command forces of 20 legions each, meaning that both of these warlords now have more soldiers than Caesar, Pompey, Crassus, and the Senate of their time combined. To pay for all this military might, the triumvirs bring back proscription lists. Caesar had shown mercy to his opponents, and everyone saw where that got him. The Second Triumvirate have their political enemies ruthlessly hunted down and killed, and use their dead enemies' wealth to pay for their armies. This is where Mark Anthony has Cicero killed as an ally of the conspirators. Many histories blame Anthony's wife, Fulvia, who was the widow of Clodius Pulcher. It was said that she got Cicero added to the list as revenge for her late husband. Then, when Cicero's severed head was delivered to her, she stabbed his tongue with silver pens. And maybe Fulvia did hold a lingering grudge, but Cicero did give a series of 14 speeches in the Senate condemning Mark Anthony on everything from his war crimes to his drunkenness and sexual impropriety. So probably Anthony didn't need to be pushed too hard by his wife to order Cicero's death. In any case, Cicero is killed while fleeing in December 43. At the beginning of 42, the Senate deifies the late Julius Caesar, makes him an official god in the Roman state religion. Octavian gets a big rhetorical boost from this. As Caesar's adopted son, he can now call himself Dewey Filius, or son of a god. Caesar's godhood is further boosted by the appearance of a comet bright enough to be seen during the day, during some games honoring Caesar. It is said to represent Caesar's spirit entering the heaven of the gods. This is also the time when the Senate renames the month formerly known as Quintilis to Julius, or July, after Julius Caesar. But Brutus and Cassius have been raising troops in the east. They still have many who are loyal to them. Octavian and Antony finally move against them. There are two battles of Philippi in Greece in 42 BCE. The first is Brutus versus Octavian and Cassius versus Antony. Brutus defeats Octavian, though not devastatingly. But Antony beats Cassius so soundly that Cassius commits suicide at the end of the battle. Three weeks later, in the second battle, Antony defeats Brutus, and Brutus kills himself. Notice the unevenness of the military prestige here. Antony is the victor in both battles. Octavian loses his battle. Antony stays in the east to settle veterans, and sends Octavian back to Italy to settle some more veterans there. But there isn't enough land in Italy to go around. Octavian winds up confiscating a lot of land from Italian civilians. He famously took land from the poet Virgil's family, who wrote about the pain it inflicted on many Italian farmers. Now that the conspirators have been defeated, the Second Triumvirate starts to do what we all knew they would, vie among themselves for sole control. In 41, Mark Anthony's brother, Lucius Antonius, stirs up a rebellion against Octavian. He is memorably assisted by Antony's wife, Fulvia, the widow of Clodius Pulcher, who might have had Cicero killed. While Antony has been in the east, Fulvia has been keeping his troops and allies in Italy loyal, and now she helps Lucius lead them against Octavian. Octavian besieges Fulvia and Lucius Antonius in the Italian city of Perusia, then captures the city in the spring of 40. He pardons Lucius and allows Fulvia to disappear into exile, where she dies a little later. He doesn't extend the same mercy to Perusia. He massacres the Parasines and lets his soldiers loot their city. Octavian was only able to destroy this rebellion because Antony wasn't sure whether he wanted to turn against his ally yet, and decided to stay in the east and let it play out. Anthony hesitating over whether Octavian should be an ally or an enemy will prove his undoing. Octavian is clear from the start that he and Antony will eventually fight. Right now, though, there is a more pressing problem. Sextus Pompey, son of Pompey the Great, is blockading Italy. Italy has been importing most of its food because of the civil wars, so the blockade causes famines. Octavian and Antony meet to decide what to do. 
they assign Octavian to the western half of Rome's territory and Antony to the east. To cement the renewed alliance, Antony marries Octavian's older sister Octavia, since Fulvia has recently died. Lepidus is not at the meeting. He has become increasingly irrelevant. In his absence, they assign Lepidus only Africa. Octavian is in charge of dealing with Sextus Pompey. Pompey wins the first few battles, so Octavian reaches out to Antony and Lepidus for help. With their support, Octavian's friend Agrippa delivers a decisive naval victory at Naulocus in 36. Octavian's military record is looking a little shoddy. He can't win major victories without help from the other triumvirs, and even then, it's Agrippa in charge rather than Octavian himself. Lepidus sees a possible weakness. Lepidus has been sidelined by the other two, even though he is older and more distinguished than Octavian. After Pompey's defeat, Lepidus demands that Pompey's troops surrender to him, not to Octavian. Octavian boldly enters Lepidus's camp and invites all the troops, Pompey's and Lepidus's, to swear allegiance to him instead. His gambit works, and he forces Lepidus into exile. So now Locus is a huge win for Octavian. It gives him a lot more troops and undisputed control of Italy and the West, and it rids him of his rivals, Sextus Pompey and Lepidus. Rome now has two powerful warlords vying for power, instead of four. But where Octavian from this point on focuses almost exclusively on the coming war with Antony, Antony is hard at work building Rome's power in the East. He is displacing disloyal kings and preparing for the war with Parthia that Rome has wanted since the loss of Crassus' standards. Antony makes an alliance with Queen Cleopatra of Egypt. And like Caesar's a decade earlier, this alliance turns into a romantic relationship. Sidebar on Cleopatra. Cleopatra's reputation in our culture is of a seductress queen, someone irresistibly beautiful who uses her sex appeal to manipulate others. This is not the Cleopatra you find in the historical record at all. For one thing, contemporary sources described her as being rather plain-looking, that she became beautiful when she opened her mouth. It was her mind, not her appearance, that made people love her. For another, she had only two known lovers, Julius Caesar and Mark Antony. Both of those men surely slept with far more people than Cleopatra ever did. Cleopatra's reputation is mixed up in two millennia of misogyny, which wants to paint her as a scheming seductress, because what she really was is more threatening. She was a good queen. She was part of the Hellenistic Greek-speaking dynasty established by Alexander the Great, which incidentally means that she was Greek and not Egyptian. In fact, she was the first ruler of Egypt in centuries who learned Egyptian so she could speak to her own common people. She also contributed greatly to the military might of Rome, aiding both Caesar and Mark Anthony, and perhaps even commanding her own troops in the field. So try to adjust your mental image of Cleopatra if you had one coming in. She is not an exotic seductress getting her hooks in the Romans, but a ruler allying with other powerful rulers for the safety and stability of her own kingdom. She winds up in committed long-term relationships with the men she allies with, probably because, as a queen, she only considers men at the same station as her as potential mates. Antony's relationship with Cleopatra causes confusion in Rome, because he and Cleopatra are completely open about it, even though Antony remains married to Octavia. He has a Roman wife and an Egyptian romantic partner. He has three children with Cleopatra. Octavian, always quick to pick up on an advantage, uses Cleopatra's wicked foreign influence on Antony as a propaganda tool. Antony remains set on doing whatever he likes, and commits a public relations blunder in 34. After he conquers Armenia, Antony has a sort of faux triumph through the streets of Alexandria, which ends with Antony conferring gifts on Cleopatra and her four children, one of them Caesar's, three of them his, as they sit on golden thrones. He gives them land, some of which was Roman territory and thus not his to give. He probably meant this as a gesture of appreciation for Cleopatra's military help, and was only thinking of how it would look to Egyptian citizens. But in Rome, it is very easy for Octavian to spin this into Antony setting up a ruling dynasty in Egypt, with himself as Cleopatra's consort. Octavian casts Cleopatra as an evil, manipulative foreigner, and Antony as her helpless stooge, who must be stopped before he gives away Rome itself to her. This is still how Cleopatra is seen by many people today, which is a testament to how successful Octavian's propaganda was. In 33, Antony finally recognizes that he needs to view Octavian as his enemy. He divorces Octavia and begins to transfer his and Cleopatra's troops to Greece. 
Octavian makes all the citizens of the West swear a loyalty oath to him in his war against Cleopatra. Notice how he casts his new civil war as a foreign war by making Cleopatra his enemy instead of Antony. The fighting takes place in Actium in western Greece throughout the summer of 31. Octavian and Antony are fairly evenly matched, so they don't make much headway. Finally, the conflict goes naval, and Octavian's ally Agrippa deals a major defeat to Antony and Cleopatra on the water. This moment, the naval battle of Actium in 31 BCE, is usually cited as the moment Octavian won control of all of Rome. But Antony and Cleopatra flee back to Alexandria, so in 30, Octavian mounts an all-out assault on the city, which surrenders almost immediately. Antony kills himself when his fleet deserts him. Nine days later, Cleopatra follows him into suicide. Octavian has now gained Egypt as a province. It is the richest land Rome has conquered in a long time, and it will soon become Rome's chief source of grain. Octavian executes Caesarion, the young son of Caesar and Cleopatra. For all his lip service to the legacy of Caesar, he won't risk having an heir of Caesar with a stronger blood tie who could challenge him. Octavian is now the sole ruler of Rome, after a decade of the worst civil war Rome has seen yet. He is the culmination of the warlords. His wars were bloodier than any before him, thousands and thousands of soldiers sacrificed to his personal ambition. He was never the best general in the field, but he kept himself on top even after numerous setbacks through clever propaganda, able associates, and his willingness to sacrifice any principle to the acquisition of more power. In the world of the warlords, only the most singularly focused, the one least tied to morals or ideals, could triumph, and that was Octavian. A few years later, in 27 BCE, the Senate grants Octavian the honorary title Augustus, an old-fashioned word that means something like well-respected. This new name, Augustus, is the name by which Octavian is known from then on. Every emperor after him is also given the title Augustus Caesar. I say emperor because that's what Augustus becomes. The first emperor, an absolute monarch, a king by another name. I've been teasing the collapse of the Republic for weeks, and here it finally is. 27 BCE, the end of the Republic and the beginning of the Empire. The great experiment begun by Brutus and Collatinus 500 years earlier is over. Rome will have a monarch for the rest of its existence. But this is not a straightforward transition. Augustus seized power by illegal means, and it is not at all clear how he should maintain it or hand it to a successor upon his death. We will grapple with those questions next week when we establish the first dynasty of imperial Rome, the Julio-Claudians. Oh, <laughs>